It's U of L today on 93.9 The Bill. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Bill. This is the show about all the cool stuff and all the great stuff going on at the University of Louisville. So hopefully you'll stick around for the next half hour or so and learn a little something. So on the show today, when a child suffers from head trauma at an early age, does it affect that child's brain development as they get older? A U of L neurosurgery faculty member has done an in-depth study and has some answers to those questions. But first, Central High School has a long history of producing great students, including many who have gone on to U of L. And as part of its signature partnership initiative in West Louisville, U of L has faculty and staff at Central, including a law program designed to get more minority students interested in becoming lawyers and hopefully going to U of L's law school. Joe Gutman is on the faculty at U of L's Brandeis School of Law, but spends most of his time down at Central High School with the Yellow Jackets, teaching law classes to high school students. And with Joe are two of his former students who are now at U of L. Lasaro Donis Munoz and Elliot Kelly Jr. Good to see all of you. Nice to see you, Mark. J- just for a little background, Joe and I have known each other for a long time. I had hair when I knew Joe Gutman, okay? So that's how long we've known each other. So. And I had dark hair, Mark. And he had dark hair, and it's now gray. That's not from teaching at Central, though, is it, Joe? Oh, no, not That's at all. from your years as a prosecutor. All right. Well, well, welcome to all of you. We'll talk a little bit about the Central program here. Well, Joe, a little bit of background on you, first off, uh, so folks know who you are, where you came from, and how you got down to Central High School. Well, um, first off, let me say I grew up in Louisville as a Cardinal fan. Uh, starting at about uh, 10 years old, I was a junior Cardinal booster and uh, fell in love with cards during the Wes Unsold Butch Beard years. Uh, and you're old. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I have a 50-year relationship with the university. Wow. And um, I went away to college, but then uh, I transferred back my sophomore year to the university and graduated from U of L in 1978. Uh, having worked as an RA in Miller Hall for a couple of years, and um, I've been teaching. Um, well, did you go? To, you went to law school, Uvell. I did right? not. I oh, did you did not. not. Oh, okay. I, I went away to law school. Oh well, a mistake you Northern made. Kentucky okay. University. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Um, you stayed in state. I stayed in state. Okay. And um, then uh, I've been teaching at the university for 32 years now as an adjunct faculty member, both in the uh, paralegal studies program and. Um, now the criminal justice department. Okay. Well, I want to talk to you about the law program that uh, U of L's got going at, uh, at Central High School, and I want to talk to these very nattily dressed young men and sitting here in front of me. Uh, so tell us about the law program at uh, that U of L has this relationship with at Central High School. Well, you mentioned in your opening the signature partnership. Mm-hmm. Um, the signature partnership is just one of the fantastic initiatives of the university. And um, I I wish more people knew all of the great things that the university was doing, and maybe it wouldn't focus on some of the negativity (laughs) of late. Um, Because the Signature Partnership and um, the Cardinal Covenant are are really important to underserved communities, the underserved community in Louisville. And so we have had a partnership with the law school since, since, I'm sorry, 2001. Uh, and then we've had an enhanced partnership since 2005. And what is, what's happened is law students work and mentor our central students. And one of the really proud accomplishments that I have of our program is that currently I have six students in law school around the country. From Central High School. From, that started in our central program. And this is because of our partnership with the law school. Our students have... Uh, uh, are working to get academically prepared for undergraduate work and then ultimately graduate school work. Okay. All right. Well, the two guys sitting here have been through that program. Lazaro Donis Munoz and Elliot Kelly Jr. You're both uh, at U of L now, right? Yes. All right. Sir. Well, who, who who wants to talk first? All right. Go ahead, Elliot. Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. So as you've already mentioned, my name is Elliot Kelly Jr. I'm actually a junior here at the university. I'm a finance major with a minor in Pan African Studies and Entrepreneurship, so a double minor. Okay. And the reason that I chose the, I went to Central High School where I was in a long government magnet. And the reason that I chose Central High School was primarily because of the signature partnership. I was considering going out of state due to due to my academics and financial aid and athletics. So I had a lot of reasons to go out of state or to a school far away from home. So I was looking at Florida A and M. 
University. I was looking at Kentucky State University, University of Pennsylvania. So a lot of high profile schools, but the school, the reason that I was drawn to UofL was because of the relationships that I developed at UofL through the signature partnership. So Dr. Nat Irvin, who's one of the prominent members in the business school, Jenny Sawyer, who holds a prominent position in the admissions office, Earl Went, who no longer works at the university, but somebody who it's also- up in Indianapolis. Yeah, exactly. Exactly at uh, IUPUI. So those are those are some of the people that I was able to not only just meet but cultivate genuine relationships with, and people who cared about me. So those relationships I was able to cultivate through the signature partnership and just my familiarity with campus due to being mm-hmm. on campus at, at least one, two to three times a week my senior year. So that that was a key right. to, that was a key factor in me choosing the University of Louisville. Well, Lazaro Donas Munoz, uh, you're, uh, what year are you at U of L? I'm a senior, political science major. Political science major, all right. Yes. And, and you were at Central High School. I was. Okay. And you're also with the Student Government Association, yes. right? I am the, currently the student body academic vice president. Very well. Congratulations on that. Thank or you. condolences, whichever may uh, fit right now. I don't know. So, <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Yes. Um, so yeah, tell me a little bit about at Central High School, what is this law program that you were in? What do you do? I mean, do you take specific courses where you learn how to be a lawyer? What do you. Uh, what is it? You take specific classes that um, the law students teach you from Brandeis, and then um, there's different types. Like your sophomore year, you'll take something like street law. You'll learn like the very minor things about like the legal education system. And then one of the, the fascinating things about it is the things that you learn in Central directly translate to the university. For example, I'm currently in constitutional law. I've had I'm in the poli sci department. I've been there for a long time. And a lot of the same things that we learned, I've already learned in high school. And a lot of the same skills are from high school. Like many people come in college, they don't know how to case a brief, brief a case. They don't know how to do anything like logistically that we learned in our classroom while we were 14, 15, and 16. So that's like the most fascinating part because you really prepare us academically and they also put us in uh, connections to actually succeed in the real world. World, For example, when you tell someone, hey, I want to be a lawyer, they don't take you too seriously. But like in this program, they did. And then through this, we were able to work in like law firms downtown. We would have clerkships, like everything that we were able to have was because of this program and because they gave us the chance. So you really started getting really into the law program. You were taking basically college level classes, for lack of a better term, when you were junior and senior in high school, right? Yeah, specifically a senior in high school, we take um, intro, intro to um, paralegal oh, studies. studies. And wow. that's basically, we were on this campus as seniors. So you want to be a lawyer? Yes, sir. All right, Elliot, do you want to be a lawyer as well? Because you're, you're in business right now, right? Yes, sir. Actually, I don't want to be. I did originally want to be a lawyer, but it was through the law and government magnet that I decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. Mm-hmm. But another class that I was offered through the partnership, it was a business law class, so it focused on the business side of it. So we learned about accounting, finance, entrepreneurship, computer information systems, project management. And it was through that I figured out if I figured out my love of finance because it's not something that I'm from the West End of Louisville mm-hmm. and find it like financial knowledge and financial competency and enrichment. That's not something that we learned in my neighborhood. I didn't know the difference between a stock and a bond. I didn't know that there was a difference. <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know about investments. I didn't know about present value, future value. I knew, and that's just basic things that you learn. Well, there's a lot of people. They don't have to live in the West End. I don't know anything about that stuff either. So, yeah, but, you know, you're, you're, and that's you like, probably know more than I do. Yeah. So like just uh, where I'm from, just the, like, I'm interested in the econ- economic development of the West End of Louisville because that's something that's very needed. So in order to create, in order to start the economic development, it starts with the people. Mm-hmm. So eventually what I want to do with my entrepreneurship minor finance major is open up a practice in the, in the West End of Louisville or some urban community that will service the West End of Louisville. Very good. Eventually that's what I want to do. We're talking to Lazaro Donis Munoz, Elliot Kelly Jr., and Joe Gutman. Uh, Joe is a professor at the University of Louisville but spends most of his time at Central High School. Uh, teaching in the law program down there, and Lazaro and Elliot are both students at the University of Louisville who went through the Central High School program. Yes. Um, so, Joe, how many students have been through that program uh, at Central High School? Do well, you on know? A give, on a given year, the average— 11 years, right? Isn't that right? Uh, 11 years since—no, uh, actually 13 years 13 since years. we've had the enhanced program. And uh, we graduate roughly 28 per year. Okay. And, and how many of those have decided—now, these are mostly minority kids— um, how many of those have decided to go on to law school or U of L or yeah, you know, who are you turning them out? Well, one one of the projects that Professor Laura Rothstein from the law school is working on is a tracking of our students because uh, it's our firm belief that once we have the data to see where our students go after they've left our program, we're going to see some great success. Uh, but without collecting the data, which is very time consuming, um, we we can't give exact numbers. But mm-hmm. our firm belief is 
that this program helps prepare our students at a much greater rate than averages. And right now you got more than 30 students from Central on U of L's campus, right? Yes. Oh, that's 30, awesome. Thir- 37 was our last count last year okay. um, that went through the Central program. And, and did they have the courtroom built down at uh, Central High School when you guys were in school there or not? Yeah. So, yeah, the courtroom, I started the program my sophomore year, and it was bu- it was finished being built by the end of my sophomore year. And it's year. an actual so – we it's an actual – yeah. Courtroom. It's not a huge one, but it's a, it's a it's a mock courtroom, right? Yeah, we were able to use the courtroom for two years, so it definitely helped our program a lot in the two years that I was able to use it. All right. So, Lazaro, what was cool about having a, a, a mock courtroom? A mock courtroom, you were able um, actually able to have um, an actual case and represent it like in court, basically. So, so you, you guys practiced like you guys were like real attorneys uh, oh, trying yeah. a case? You had your plaintiffs, you had your defendants, you had your judge, you had everything. You had to become prepared, get on the podium, and, you know, just everything about like realistic. So Joe, did these kids know what they were doing when they were uh, juniors and seniors in high school, they trying did. a case? <laughs> they did. Um, there are a lot of great students at Central High School, and uh, you could see the talent that both Elliot and Lazaro uh, possess when uh, you know they were in 11th, 12th grade. That uh, wow, this is a young man that's got incredible potential. Mm-hmm. What does this say in your mind about the University of Louisville and the Signature Partnership? You touched on a little bit well, earlier. Well, the, the commitment of the university is amazing. Um, as a graduate of the university, I mean, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the Signature Partnership and the Cardinal Covenant, which allows students to be able to afford college. And as a high school teacher, we, we tell our students, work hard, uh, do well on your ACT, you know, do everything right but they've got to find a way to be able to afford college. And the Cardinal Covenant does that. And the Porter Scholarship. I mean, um, if people knew the commitment um, of the university as much as they know the athletic department um, mm-hmm. towards, towards our kids, uh, they'd be really proud of the university because it's, the university is just doing amazing things to help uh, people uh, who can benefit. I think this year's freshman class is the largest uh, percentage of minority students um, in U of L history. I believe it's something like seventeen or eighteen percent this year. So we are out there recruiting great students like these two, and 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 trying to get them to stick around and maybe become lawyers or great businessmen or whatever. So um, I'd like to ask you two: What did you learn out of that program, that the U of L program down at Central High School? What was there anything you learned? Not just whether you wanted to be a lawyer or a businessman or whatever, but was there anything that you could take with you? Um, to college and that you think you're going to uh, take with you for the rest of your life? So the biggest thing that I learned was the importance of thinking. So Mr. Gub- so just being able to think on your own and then there's certain habits. So Mr. Gubman is still – so he taught uh, Sean Covey's seven habits of highly highly effective adults, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of them. So be proactive, begin with the end in mind, put first things first, think win-win. There's a lot of habits. and But the biggest thing that I was able to take, take away was just the ability to think holistically being able to think for myself because growing up you're growing up you're a product of your environment and you're a product of everything that people instill in you but Mr. Gutman questioned us a lot and he made us question what we've always believed always playing devil's advocate in a situation always talking about the real world and how that applies to our lives now and how that will apply to our lives in the future so getting us to think about things that are bigger than ourselves and being able to help us form our own opinions so now that I'm in college it helps me in my classes because I'm able to study a lot better because I understand how I understand how I how I think and how I operate. It helps me in my involvement and in my community service because I know what I'm passionate about. Um, I'm starting to find out what my purpose is and all that type. And what got the ball rolling was Mr. Gutman and the signature partnership. Lazaro, what you think? One of the other things that the program instills in you is the belief in yourself as well. Um, when you put yourself in certain situations through like this program, whether it's working at a law firm, um, presenting a case in your courtroom, et cetera, et cetera, you really learn a lot about yourself and you instill yourself like this confidence that you can succeed in life. Because many times we're like in these like um, different communities where like many people don't have that same experience, don't have a support system, many people don't really believe in themselves. And then this program really gave us the opportunity to do that because we were actually taught by an actual lawyer himself and then law students so that was pretty huge and then that same um, belief in ourselves translated to the real world whether it was college the workforce etc because like for example I would have I would have not have the same academic success if it wasn't for 
this program. I wouldn't have campaigned at the university. I wouldn't have been working with the dean of students. I wouldn't have been working with the university provost or president if it wasn't for any of this. So it, gave you, it gives you that prompt confidence that you need, especially in your early um, development. So that's, that was the biggest thing I've learned. And Joe Gutman, former ace prosecutor in the Jefferson County Commonwealth Attorney's Office. You handle a lot of wild cases when you were a prosecutor and you and I hung around together. Um, what have you learned? You've been teaching now at Central High School for how many years? 14? This is, no, this is my 18th school 18th year. 18th year, you've been a, been a teacher at Central <clears throat> High School. So yeah. what have you learned in the 18 years about these kids and about the, uh, the relationship uh, with the University of Louisville? Well, I've, I've learned a lot. Um, first off, that a, the courtroom is a lot like the classroom. When you're in the classroom, you want to convince your audience, your students, just like you want to convince a jury that what you're saying is correct. And um, uh, what I've learned is there's such amazing potential in our community and our young people. And we have to invest in our young people. And that, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you, just, you just see it day after day after day, the energy, uh, the desire to be successful. And so many of our students, um, um, you know, come from very, very tough situations that's not of their doing. Mm -hmm. And so creating this pathway for their future success is important for all of us, is this win-win. And this is, you know, this is where uh, our university has just done an amazing job of helping uh, our students. You're a proud daddy. I am very much so. I mean, Proud daddy. when I see him on campus, I just beam, especially when I see him in the library. <laughs> Studying. Studying. Studying what they're yeah, supposed to be like, doing. I usually, you know, I'm usually flipping with them and say, uh, how come you didn't do that in high school? <laughs> but, All right. Well, Joe Gutman, uh, he was a professor at the University of Louisville, but again, spends his time teaching the students down at Central High School. And Elliot and Lazaro, congratulations and uh, good luck when you graduate and get out of college, whatever you decide to do. Beatrice Ugalamaneza is a, an assistant professor at the University of Louisville who works in the Department of Neurosurgery and in the famed Spinal Cord Injury Research Center, which has got quite famous over the past few years for yes. their work with spinal cord injury patients. Mm -hmm. She has looked at abusive head trauma in babies and what the long-term impact on those child's brains might be. Beatrice, good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks Welcome. for having me. All right. So so what do you do? What's your, what's your job down there with the Spinal Cord Injury Research Center or in the... Uh, in the Department of Neurosurgery? So I wear two hats over there. Um, I work as a researcher in outcomes research, um, and I've worked there for about eight years, um, working in the outcomes lab with Dr. Boachi. And then the other hat is being a statistician, um, support for all the researchers in uh, Spinal Cord Research Center and Department of Neurosurgery. All right, so the statistician part is kind of where this uh, the study came in, wasn't it? Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly, yes. So we collaborated with uh, Dr. Nuno over in California, and, um, you know, it was through the outcomes lab uh, for Dr. Boachi. Okay, so you're kind of looking at, as I understand it uh, on, on this, at kids that have head trauma at a very young age. So why don't you yes. describe what the research project was, first off? So the research project was looking at uh, the long-term um, outcomes and disabilities that children who have abusive head trauma have. Um, there has been studies before that have shown that uh, kids do have long-term um, um, consequences of abusive head trauma. However, those studies were very uh, small in terms of sample sizes, or they were just single institutions. So we wanted to see if we look at a national database and a lot of children over the whole country, what do we see? Okay. Um, yeah. And children was um, between zero and th uh, under three, so zero, one, and two. How many kids did you look at in this study? Um, I believe 940. Okay. We found 940 um, who we could follow until they turn age of five. Age mm -hmm. of five was important to us because that's kindergarten age. Kindergarten age. When, okay. they, when they start going to school. All right. And when you're talking about head trauma, what are you talking about? Kids that are beaten as, as little kids or hit their head yes. on a table or fall? Or what were you talking about? No, not accidental trauma. So this is abusive head trauma. So the beating and shaking. Shaking and babies. Thrown and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That is caused by somebody because they're being abused. Okay. Okay. And, and most of those cases happened when, when they were really young babies, under under a year old or something? And weren't most of the subjects under a year old? So actually it can happen all the way to under five. But but I mean most of the most, subjects that were in your study. Were, yes. Okay. Most of the subjects were um, under one, under two. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mainly zero and one and then a few kids who were two. All right. Well, let's talk about what you found. What would you find? 
So we found that those children, uh, most of them do experience uh, long-term disabilities, uh, about 72% actually, to be accurate. And uh, most of them, the most disabilities that we see are developmental delays and learning disabilities and epilepsy. Wow. And and those were up to age five, yeah, right? Up to age five, yes. And the percentage was of those, of those kids that had some sort of brain trauma at an early age, what yes. was the percentage again? 72%. That, 72%. So yeah. basically three quarters of the kids yes. that you looked at. Mm-hmm. Hmm. They do experiment, yeah. yeah. Were you surprised? Um, no, we were not surprised. I think the, the surprising thing was how early it can happen, these disabilities. And it's as early as two months mm. after the trauma. Wow. Yes. We're talking to Beatrice ugili Meneza, who is with the, the Spinal Cord Injury Research Center at the University of Louisville and also yes. with the Department of Neurosurgery. She's yes. an assistant professor at U of L. Yes. Um, what were what else came out of that study in your mind that um, was important, or yes. you know, what are some of the stats that are the things that we should know about that study? I think the surprising thing to us was that Medicare children, the children who are under Medicaid, are at higher risk. Even after we adjust for everything, age, gender, injury, um, type or injury severity score, the children under Medicaid have are at higher risk of, of experiencing these, these disabilities. So that was kind of surprising to us. So let me let me understand that. So mm-hmm. of the of the kids, you had set what was it seven hundred and some odd kids, nine hundred and forty nine hundred forty yeah. kids that mm-hmm. you looked at. How many of those kids came from families that had Medicaid, and how many of those came from private insurers? Ooh, I don't remember you know? the exact numbers, okay. but mo- most of them were Medicaid, though. Were Medicaid, so, yes. so they came from like lower income quarters. families. Low income families, yes. So are you saying that the um, the kids that suffered some sort of trauma mm-hmm. in a private, uh, in a home where the parents could afford insurance, mm-hmm. uh, and if a kid with Medicaid that's on mm-hmm. Medicaid had the exact same head it, trauma, mm-hmm. he's, so it, he's more likely, the kid with, uh, from the Medicaid home is more likely to suffer long-term consequences? Is that what you're saying? Exactly, yes. So if they have same age, same gender, same injury uh, scoring, like injury um, severity, um, the kid in Medicaid is more likely to experience long, hmm. long-term disabilities. And, and you could attribute that directly to the uh, head trauma, or was it some other factors so, because they're from lower-income families? We, um, the explanation that we, we, we were able to advance and that we probably should explore more mm-hmm. is that it might be because of uh, lack of um, access to health care. So there, are, there have been some studies that have shown that um, Medicaid, uh, children on Medicaid or their parents don't have um, adequate specialty uh, care access and they don't have as much counseling as the, those in uh, private um, mm-hmm. insurance. Yeah. And the kids you looked at, you said were up to age five, right? Yeah, we look, so we followed them. So we looked at, we extracted them when they were um, zero, one, and two. And then we follow them up. And the follow up is to look at their interaction with the healthcare system. So how they get their care, the diagnosis, the hospitalizations, like u- utilization of healthcare mm-hmm. um, until they turn five. So that means a child who was two was followed un- for three years until the, the, this uh, into kindergarten. Right, so you, and, and three quarters of those kids at age five were suffering from some behavioral disorders, communication deficits, developmental delays, epilepsy, those kinds of things. Yes. Is there any thought of following those same kids as they get older, taking that same group of 900 and some 40. odd students, uh, or not students, but kids, children, and, yes. children mm-hmm. and following them to their age 10 or 11 to see the what is the severity of their developmental disability? Yeah, so that's one of the um, research that we're going to do going forward. Uh, right now, we are focusing on going a little bit backwards to see if there is, you know, before they get even diagnosed or before the healthcare can pick up that abuse, because I don't think anybody gives that up. That might, you know, some, I'm abusing my child or something. Mm-hmm. So, but before that can be even be caught by the healthcare system, we're trying to go backwards to see if we can there's some indicative Mm -hmm. um, indication that, um, you know, that these kids have. Mm -hmm. Um, And then after we do that, then we'll try to go farther in the future. 
We're talking again with Beatrice Ugilu Meneza, who is uh, with the University of Louisville, and she's in the Department of Neurosurgery. She's an assistant professor there. And what, so what's the message to parents who are uh, getting mad at their kids? And, you know, obviously you don't want anybody to abuse their kid. Right, right. But instead of just it's a moment it's not a momentary thing mm-hmm. uh, abusing your kid one time and shaking him really hard one mm-hmm. time when they're a year old mm-hmm. it this has long term impact this on your has kid. long term impacts yeah so um I, i'm not as uh, you know i'm not a psychologist or anything like that <laughs> but i would say you know coming from this research that you have to be careful because this has long term effects and if your kids get epilepsy from this i don't think you will you know, getting any anything from it. I think the best thing to do if you get mad at your child or something, it happens with all parents, just step away, try your best to step away or, you know, think about long-term consequences and if it's really worth it. Mm-hmm. And then try to find alternative mm-hmm. ways to punish <laughs> your child or something. <laughs> Obviously. Yes. Uh, and, and out of the 940 uh, children, mm-hmm. did any of them have... Was there any one symptom that that showed up more than others? In other words, did epilepsy show up in more than half of them? Did uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, behavior problems show up in more than half of them? Were, were there some that, that expressed themselves more than others? Yes, so develop, developmental delays uh, were the ones that we observed. And you can think about it because that's the age that we looked at, right, until five. That's what uh, healthcare is, you know, trying to look at. And the next one was learning disabilities. So, um, and that learning is preschool learning and Mm-hmm. Um, learning right. disability, and then epilepsy. Yeah, and you three. talked also about that the uh, lack of health care may be the, the problem that led to the parents who have kids with, on Medicaid that mm-hmm. uh, have deeper problems perhaps out of being abused and getting head trauma than the parents who don't. So when you followed them into the health care system, was it just a fact that they didn't have access to it because they've got Medicaid? They got Medicaid, yeah. And they just didn't go or the parents just didn't take their kid uh, um, to get checked. So we didn't. We haven't explored that. That was one explanation that we advanced as something that we can explore later, because for us too, it was very surprising. We did not expect it that we were we were expecting that it would be the same, but it wasn't. So we tried to look in the literature what could be the explanation for this, and that's what we found as a possible explanation is access to healthcare. And access to healthcare, obviously, they have Medicaid, right? So they can. They can go to, to 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 the hospital, but we all know that you know not all. Uh, first of all, um, this Medicaid has some rules. That when do mm-hmm. you go? How do you go? Right. And all that. Um, you know, when do you go to specialty? When do you not go? You have to have co-pays, and referrals, all that stuff, yeah. and well, the, yeah. you, most of them don't have co-pays. I think Medicaid, but there are some rules of when do you go. Somebody has to refer you first, and all that kind of things. And plus, maybe the parents, because most of them are lower income and lower education, all that. Maybe they don't. They don't really know, and mm-hmm. they don't have as much counseling, and they don't know what to seek for. Right. Um, right. Yeah. All right. So the bottom line message that you would give to parents after going through the study and the data and the long term impact of uh, shaken babies and, and, and head trauma to, to babies and, and smaller children is what? What's your message to parents? So my message to parents is that be careful. Uh, protect your children because um, abusive head trauma has long term consequences. I also want to give a message to the healthcare system. Pay close attention to children and most especially children on Medicaid. If there is something sus- suspicious or suspect, please explore a little bit more. Explore a little bit more. I've heard that before on this show from some doctors. <laughs> All right. Beatrice ugili it it has uh, been terrific to meet you and keep up the good work. That'll about do it for this edition of UofL Today with Mark Hebert, which you can hear every Monday and Tuesday night at 6 on 93.9 The Ville. You can also listen to the podcast of the shows on SoundCloud or watch the programs on Metro TV and KETKY throughout the week or on UofL's YouTube channel anytime. Check out all the UofL news, videos, programming, and all the stuff going on at UofL at uoflnews.com. Thanks for listening to UofL Today with Mark Hebert and Go Cards! <laughs>